I know what you're doing, or at least I can guess what you're doing. And what you're doing is that you're faking it. You're pretending that you are designing your applications to be microservices. I might be wrong, maybe you are really doing it, but let's first explore what microservices are, and then you tell me whether what you're doing is really microservices. Let's start with an obvious question. What are microservices? We can explain microservices through five points or five important aspects that they all have to have. They are highly maintainable and testable. What that means is that you can maintain a microservice in isolation and that's relatively easy simply because it's small. And it is easy to test it again because it is small. Now in your case that might not be true because you are not really doing microservices, but we are going to get there, so bear with me a bit more. They are loosely coupled, and this is important. That means that one microservice is not coupled with other microservices. Microservices do not depend on each other. They communicate in whichever way they communicate. They have their lives, and those lives are independent from each other. That does not mean that there is no coupling at all, but that it is very loose. They are organized around business capabilities. We do not split monoliths into microservices based on technical aspects. We do not create a microservice that is communicating with a database and another one that is doing a front-end and a third one that is maybe a back-end and a fourth one that is IPI. No, that would be dividing services based on technical aspects. That's the same thing as three-tier or four-tier architecture that we had in the past. That's not what we're doing. We are organizing microservices around business needs or business capabilities and they have nothing to do with technical aspects of our code, of our architecture or what's or not. They are owned by a small team and this could be the most important aspect and the reason behind microservices. We cannot work in large teams. When there are tens or hundreds of people working on an application, you know, the big monolith, those are not teams. A hundred people cannot work in a team. That's a soccer match or a school reunion. That's not a team. A team is a small number of people that can work well together independently from other teams. That's what a team is. And small number means five, six, maybe ten people, but ten people would be a maximum number of people that can be considered a team. And that team needs to be autonomous. That team needs to be self-sufficient. What that means is that such a team needs to have full control of a service. Those five, six, ten people gather requirements, write code of applications, they write code for testing, they test, they run CI-CD pipelines, they deploy applications, they monitor applications. They are fully in charge of an application, or we call it microservice. And now comes the part that will allow you to distinguish whether something is really a microservice or no. I mean, you need to fulfill all the previous points that I mentioned, but this one is the most important one. A microservice needs to be independently deployable from all other microservices or any other part of the system. That's the part where I usually catch people and tell them, Hey, no, you're not doing microservices. These are not microservices. This is a distributed monolith. If you need to coordinate releases across multiple microservices and deploy them all together, that's not a microservice-based architecture. That's distributed monolith. And that's what most people are doing. They come back to me and ask me, hey, Victor, how do we coordinate the release of multiple microservices? When I ask them, why would you want to do that? And then they explain how they're making changes to multiple services and that they need to deploy them all together because the feature is split across multiple ones and there are interdependencies, you know, they're not loosely coupled and so on and so forth. That's what happens when you take a monolith, you split it into random pieces, you do not understand what you're doing, and you now say, hey, I broke it into multiple applications, therefore it's microservices. And they still need to be deployed all together. And guess what? That's the same as what you had. If you split a monolith in a way that all the pieces are still required to be deployed at the same time whenever we need to create a new release, then you're not having any benefit. Remember, loosely coupled, independently deployable, managed by a small team that does not depend on other teams. I get passionate about this because I argue with people a lot about uh, their architecture and what they're doing and what they're not doing. So I will calm down. 
Okay, this is now calm version of me. Let me continue this video in a calm fashion. Why do we want to use microservices? No, I, I cannot do it. I cannot be calm. Why do we want to use microservices? The three main benefits behind microservices are continuous delivery, deployment velocity, and self-sufficient teams. Now, to be honest, you can do all three of those things without microservices, but if you adopt microservices, if your applications are small, easy to manage, have a dedicated team and independently deployable from each other, then your continuous delivery is going to be so much easier because you can focus on a single small application. You can manage that focus with a single team and that team can create continuous delivery or continuous integration or whatever other type of pipelines that does whatever it needs to do. And what that pipeline needs to do is usually relatively simple and straightforward because you're not dealing with a huge monster, you're dealing with a cute little bunny. Deployment velocity is going to increase greatly because to coordinate 100 people working on a huge application takes a lot of time and delivering all the disparate pieces that are done by different people in that huge application is very complex and it is normal that it takes months or weeks, sometimes days if you're very lucky to make a new release of a huge application. When it's small, you can release it multiple times a day. It's easy, it's not really problematic. You can release every single change you make relatively easy and fast. As a result of that, your users will be getting benefits or new features that you're providing with high frequency. Finally, you can have self-sufficient teams. There is no need to open Jira ticket and request something from team A and then team A requests something from team B and team B goes to team C and then you're handing over from one person to another, from one team to another and you're trying to coordinate the madness behind having tens or hundreds of people working on the same thing. You have a small application and you can manage it with a single team. If there is a single benefit I would point out, that's that. Being able to manage something with only a few people that can work in isolation from other people because they do not depend on each other. Everybody can run at their own speed and deliver value as soon as they can. And then we get to the popular subject of how do microservices talk to each other. That was problematic in the past because figuring out where microservices are, trying to discover versions of their APIs and locate them somewhere across the cluster was difficult. But it is not difficult anymore. We have service discovery. If you're using Kubernetes or some other advanced platform, you can easily find microservices and you can talk to them directly through HTTP, RPC or whichever protocol you prefer. Or you can do something even better. You can design your microservices to talk to each other indirectly. You can use message brokers, events, pub subs, or what's or not. And that tends to be difficult for people to grasp even though we are using asynchronous communication in our daily lives all the time. What that really means is that services would be sending messages or creating events without worrying who is listening to those messages, to those events. We can avoid designing services that need to communicate with other services, but just create a message, create an event, and stop worrying about who will listen to those events. And then you have some other services that are listening to events and doing whatever they want to do with those events or messages. It's not a responsibility of a service to figure out what somebody wants to do. A responsibility of a service could be to just announce, hey, I just added this to a shopping cart. If somebody wants to do something with it, great. If nobody wants to do anything with it, again, great. I said what I have to say and I'm finished. So communication can be direct or indirect. You can go with a more traditional approach and just configure services to speak directly to each other. Or you can use events, message brokers, pub subs or whatever else you want to use depending on your use cases. And then usually people come to me, hey, but how do we test microservices? And that tends to be tricky or easy depending on how proficient you are with the things that were happening for the last 20 years or, or even more. We are supposed to have clear contracts of the APIs of each of the service. And that's not even directly related with microservices or not microservices, monoliths or what's or not. Every API should have a clear contract that, that is probably, potentially, hopefully created in advance. Once we have those contracts, once we know what each API is, we can easily create stubs or mocks or other methods to provide simulations of those APIs. Once we have mocks or stubs or whatever we are using, 
we can test our services in isolation without having any other service running in a system. Now that will not get us to the finish line. We can write unit tests and functional tests that run in isolation and validate a service without really having the rest of the services up and running. However, sooner or later we get to the part of running integration tests or system level tests or whatever type of tests we are running at the very end of the process. That's maybe 10% or 20%, actually more likely 5% of our tests. We still need to have them. And to run such types of tests, we can run our service wherever we want. It can be even on our laptop, as long as it is connected to production services for all its dependencies. And then you would say, hey, it cannot be production because my service depends on some other service and it has to have a newer release of that dependent service because I created my service to depend on that service and you get my point. That's wrong. That means that they are not loosely coupled. Every single service should be designed in a way that it communicates with the production release of all other services it needs to communicate with. You cannot assume that you depend on something that does not exist, and it does not exist until it is running in production. That's why we version our APIs and make sure that we are speaking with a specific version of a specific API of a specific service instead of depending on some pending work. Then we are not independent, then we are not loosely coupled, and then we do not yet understand how important it is to version APIs. Now, to be honest, there are problems with microservices as well. One of the problems is that there is potential duplication of effort. If each team is working on one or more microservices and it is fully responsible for those services, there might be duplication of work across multiple teams. When done right, that's not a big duplication and the benefits behind microservices outweigh the potential downsides of having duplicated work, as long as that duplication is small. Now, if we find out that there is a lot that is duplicated, then we probably split our microservices in a wrong way. We should probably try to understand what is that big duplication across services and create a new service that will be used by multiple services to accomplish something, whatever that something is. Integration tests can be slightly more complicated as well, but that's not such a big deal today anymore because we adopted containers, we are running schedulers, we have GitOps. It's very easy to replicate an environment. It is relatively easy today to create a system where everything is set up just as it should be. So integration tests are not as big of a deal or a problem with microservices as it was before. The biggest one is operational complexity. That was horribly difficult five years ago, and now it is just difficult without the word horribly. We advanced a lot. We have containers, we have service discovery, we have schedulers, we have a bunch of things that we didn't have a few years ago. So operational complexity is now less complex than it was before. Nevertheless, it is still complex. And that's normal because if you're managing hundreds of something instead of one thing, it is to be expected that operational complexity will increase. The real question is whether that increase in operational complexity is higher or lower than the benefits we are getting with microservices. And you need to evaluate that for yourself because it really depends on the experience. Operational complexity downsides could be here and the benefits of microservices here or it could be the other way around. If it's the other way around, then microservices might not be the best fit for you. Maybe your system is small, so why would you break things into small pieces if the whole is already small? Maybe you do not have enough expertise in operations. Maybe you don't have SREs, maybe you don't this, maybe you don't that. There are many reasons why microservices might not be a good thing for you. There are reasons why you shouldn't use microservices in the first place. But there is no good reason for you to say that you're doing something you're not. If you're having monolith, that's okay. If you're having distributed monolith, that's okay as well. If you're having microservices, that's great. But you shouldn't say that you're doing microservices if you're doing distributed monolith and the other way around. So let's do a quick test with three questions that you should ask yourself. Is each of the services owned by a single, small, independent, self-sufficient team? Are your microservices loosely coupled with other microservices or other parts of the system? 
Are you deploying new releases of your services independently from any other parts of your system? If the answer to all those questions is yes, then well done, you are really doing microservices. Or maybe you're not, you're probably doing microservices. There are other things to consider. But hey, you are my hero. Well done, my friend. Otherwise, if you said no to any of those three questions, then you're not doing microservices. You probably broke your monolith in a way that now you have a distributed monolith. I mean monolith split into pieces running across your cluster with all those pieces coupled together, developed together and deployed together. That is a distributed monolith. And if that's what you're doing, then you are faking it. And one more thing, don't go just yet. Keep sending me questions and suggestions what to do next. You asked me what microservices are. This is what I'm giving you. Keep your questions and suggestions flowing in the comments of my videos. And I will go through them sooner or later. I promise.